Howdy, folks. Max Volume here. I've had this British fighter's book since, no, oh, geez, seems like sometime in the late 70s. I was always really interested in it. And I didn't get the other two until, like, last year. Most of these airplanes are failures, and very few are successful. Now, Mr. Bruce, who wrote these books, like most British people, were um, kind of bonkers about um, things like serial numbers and a lot of minute details that, well, <clears throat> for every one person who's interested in that sort of thing, a hundred people uh, <laughs> um, click off and go someplace else because it's <laughs> too dang boring. So I've left out some of the less important things um, to keep these things as interesting as possible. And here's a couple of quick things I'd like to uh, include. And I apologize to all my airplane friends who already know all this stuff. With biplanes, and something they didn't figure out until after the war, was if the upper and lower wing were of equal size. They didn't want to be directly in alignment. Um, it, it was much better to have one staggered, um, either in front of or behind for interference drag reasons. Also, there's a difference between radial engines and rotary engines. The rotary engines have the propeller attached directly to the engine, and they both spin around, which seems kind of crazy. But it's mostly done for cooling, because they hadn't quite gotten that one figured out yet. And radial engines were not perfected until the well, they weren't perfected until after the war, really. But they were they were trying. Also, this is a very big project. There are these three books, and I really honestly am not sure if I can live long enough to get through this whole thing. Um, <laughs> uh, wish me luck. All right, on with the movie. The A.D. Scout. In 1915, the Admiralty required a fighter aircraft capable of serving in the anti-airship role. To meet this requirement, Harris Booth of the Air Department of the Admiralty designed an unusual single-seat fighter, powered by a 100-horsepower Nome Monosupape rotary engine. It was decided that the new AD Scout should be built of commercial materials, that would be more readily available than some of the special steels and other materials that were required for most contemporary aircraft. All of its metal fittings were to be made of ordinary mild steel, an inexpensive form of turnbuckle that was designed for the aircraft. Materials apart, the AD Scout was structurally conventional, having a wire-braced fabric-covered wooden airframe. All the trailing edges were of wire but in appearance it was markedly unconventional. It was a pusher, with an nacelle mounted high in order to give the pilot a good field of view. In fact, the spars of the upper wings passed under the upper longerons of the nacelle. The tail booms, supporting an enormous tailplane, were parallel in plan and elevation. The twin fins and rudders were thus widely spaced, some eleven feet apart. Since this was so, it was thought that only one further point of support was required in the undercarriage. To use only one wheel was considered impossible, however, and there were two landing wheels mounted unusually close together on two parallel skids. Four prototypes were ordered, two from Hewlett and Blondeau Limited, and two from the Blackburn Airplane and Motor Company. It seemed likely that all were completed. Hewlett and Blondeau were understandably uneasy about the practicality of the A.D. Scout's undercarriage. With the concurrence of A.W. Stedman of the Air Department, they designed and built an alternative undercarriage with a wider track. This modification was not approved, however, and the firm were instructed to deliver the aircraft to the Royal Naval Air Service Aerodrome at Chingford. Of the Blackburn-built aircraft, only one is known to have been delivered to Chingford. It is believed that the completed aircraft were considerably heavier than the estimated weight, and that they proved to be unsatisfactory in the air. 
The type was not developed, but during its brief existence, it earned the nickname Sparrow. Reports have persisted to the effect that the AD Scout was to be armed with a two-pounder Davis gun. This may have been considered, but apart from the near impossibility of installing that freakish weapon on the Scout, it seems unlikely that the aircraft could have lifted the gun and its ammunition. Official notes state that the Scout's armament was a Lewis gun. The Alcock A-1 John Alcock had made a name for himself as a pilot in the two years preceding the war. Less than eight months after the armistice, he and Arthur Witten Brown won immortality on their transatlantic flight. On the outbreak of the war, Alcock joined the Royal Naval Air Service. After two frustrating years on instructional duties at East Church, he was posted to number two wing at Royal Naval Air Service, Mudros, in the Aegean Theater of War. There he flew a variety of aircraft, including the Sopwith Triplane and Camel. In the summer of 1917, Alcock made an airplane of his own. It was a single-seat fighter, well-proportioned and of clean lines. The Alcock Scout employed several Sopwith components. The forward portion of the fuselage and the lower wings had been modified from triplane components, and the upper wings were basically those of a Sopwith pup. Two-bay interplane bracing was employed. The ailerons, which were fitted to the upper wing only, extended inboard as far as the inner struts, and were appreciably longer than those of the pup. The tailplane and elevators had once belonged to a camel. The rear fuselage and fin and rudder were of original design. In recognition of its part parentage, Alcock called his scout the Sopwith Mouse. The fuselage was mounted in mid-gap, thus bringing the upper wing level with the pilot's eyes, where at least obscured his field of vision. The engine was a 110-horsepower Clerget. It has been reported that a 100-horsepower Gnome Monosopape was originally installed, but this is doubtful. A single Vickers gun was mounted centrally on top of the forward fuselage. Alcock was denied the pleasure of flying his creation, for he was taken prisoner on the 30th of September 1917, before the A-1 was completed. It seems probable that the aircraft first flew on 15th October 1917, when it proved to be fast and maneuverable. The Alcock Scout was flown at Mudros and Stavros, notably by Flight Lieutenant Starbuck. It was finally written off in a crash. The Armstrong Whitworth FK-1 The Newcastle engineering firm of Sir W. G. Armstrong Whitworth and Company, Limited, opened an aircraft department in 1914. Its general manager was I. Fairbairn Crawford, its chief designer, Frederick Koolhoven. Koolhoven was a Dutchman who, at the age of 25, had joined the French Depperdussin Company, who had played a leading part in the design of the fast racing Depperdussins. He transferred to the British Depperdussin Company, where he designed several aircraft, then to the Armstrong Whitworth Company. The first airplane that he designed for Armstrong Whitworth was the FK-1. It was originally conceived as a monoplane, but the design was revised and it emerged as a single-seat biplane with single bay wings. Ailerons were fitted to the upper wing only. It was intended to have the 80-horsepower Gnome engine but had to make do with a 50-horsepower gnome. There was no fixed tailplane. The balanced elevators were similar to those of the contemporary moraine Saulnier designs. On its first flight, the FK-1 was flown by Koolhoven himself. The burly Dutchman's great weight taxed the underpowered little aircraft, which struggled off the ground and flew twice around the town moor at Newcastle at a height of about 
50 feet. Enlarged ailerons were subsequently fitted, and at a later stage a fixed tailplane with plane elevators replaced the original moraine-like elevators. Development of the FK-1 was not pursued, however, and it was doubtful whether it was ever seriously considered as a military aircraft of any kind. It provides an interesting comparison with the contemporary Sopwith, Bristol, and Martinside single-seat scouts. Armstrong Whitworth three-seat triplanes. Following the FK-1 came the FK-2, two-seater. It is not possible to be certain of the sequence of Coolhoven designs between the FK-3 and the FK-8. It seems possible that the next Coolhoven designed Armstrong Whitworth aeroplane was an extraordinary triplane that may well have been designated FK-5. It was a three-seater powered by a 250-horsepower Rolls-Royce of the type that was later named Eagle, and intended to provide a means of getting two Lewis guns airborne. These guns were to be wielded by two gunners, each in a simple, shallow nacelle mounted on the middle wing. Coolhoven placed these gunners ahead of the tractor airscrew, which rotated only a few inches ahead of the middle wing, the longest of the main planes. The pilot's cockpit was behind this wing, and his view for landing must have been poor. Long, horn-balanced ailerons were fitted to the central wing. The undercarriage was unique. Two main wheels were mounted close together on a central sprung leg. There was a rear skid just behind the trailing edge of the bottom wing, and a small stabilizing wheel was carried under each wing tip. Flying controls were conventional. The rudder had a horn balance area, top and bottom. Even if the difficult ground handling characteristics could have been mastered, it is doubtful whether the triplane could have flown safely. Captain I. Fairbairn Crawford, then general manager of the Armstrong Whitworth Aircraft Department, after a heated argument with Coolhoven, refused to allow it to be flown. When, early in 1916, the Royal Flying Corps issued a requirement for a long-range aircraft for escort fighter and anti-airship duties, Coolhoven set about adapting the triplane design to meet that specification. Whereas the first triplane had been built as a private venture, the later aircraft was ordered officially, and it has been reported that serial numbers were allotted for four prototypes. Apparently, it was intended to divert two of these aircraft to the Royal Naval Air Service, with the 250-horsepower Rolls-Royce engine that were to be transferred from the Royal Naval Air Service from the War Office. These two aircraft were expected from March 1916 onward, but their numbers disappear from the record in early November. Martlesham Heath was aware in mid-May 1916 that the Armstrong Whitworth triplane was being reconstructed, and there can be little doubt that this was a reference to the construction of the revised design. There are indications that the revised triplane was originally intended to have a span of only 41 feet, a length of 30 feet 3 inches, and a height of 13 feet 4 inches. It may therefore have been conceived as little more than a long-range version of the original design. In its modified form, a speed of 100 miles per hour at 6,000 feet was expected, with a load of fuel for six hours. The estimated time to climb to that height was 11 minutes. The official note recording these details state that two, not four, aircraft were to be built. It seems that only one was built, and it emerged as a wholly redesigned aircraft. Much larger than its predecessor, it had a conventional fuselage that filled the lower gap, and it rested in a normal tail-down attitude. The four wheels of the undercarriage were mounted in pairs on two substantial oleo legs. In general, disposition of the main planes were similar to those of the first triplane. They were still braced as a single bay structure, but there were auxiliary interplane struts at the mid-bay points. The gunner's nacelles were underslung from the central main plane. 
flight tests of the second triplane were made by Peter Legg and Lieutenant R. Pays. Performance was disappointing. No one liked the aircraft, and by the time it appeared, gun synchronizing mechanisms had become available. Mercifully, the three-seat triplane was abandoned. <laughs>